Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Re Behind the Scenes. Every Thursday, I host an episode of either Re Behind the Scenes or Transformation Time. My name is Diana Lizarazzo, and today we have two guest speakers. It will be Faison and Babar. Now, before we get started, I want to share some exciting news with you. I have a social networking platform for the real estate investing industry. So if you're a real estate investor, if you're a real estate mentor, or you're a real estate professional, so lawyers, accountants, contractors, everyone else basically that supports real estate investors, this is the platform that you want to be a part of. Not only do you get to create amazing profiles where people can actually understand who you are, which you'll get to be able to check out. Um, You'll be able to check out Bauer's profile and you'll be able to check out Faison's profile and a lot more of the things like setting up calendars, connecting with others, just social networking and every aspect there to transform the way you work. Now let's get back to the show. On Read Behind the Scenes, our guest speakers are here to share with you their experiences. And they do that, we're gonna be talking about the purpose of the project, what, what was their intentions behind it, high level numbers. And the most fun part of all is hearing about all those problems that were encountered, how they solved them. And if it was something new for them, then what they would do differently. So a great learning experience. If you guys are ready, send some thumbs up, let's send some hearts and let's welcome them on the stage. And uh, let's see how this works. I've actually never put two people on. Oh, there's one. Hey, Faison. Hey, Diana. Oh. How are you doing? Both of you. Hey, Mama. Hey, Diana. How are you? Great. It's awesome to have you guys here. The dynamic duo. That's awesome. Making waves in the real estate investing industry. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for, Thank having, you for having us. And I'm just going to do a quick. Quick shout out, I see Sean from Re-Nursing says hi there. So I guess uh, saying hi to you guys. And so let's start with just before we get started on hearing on your project, let's hear about each one of you. If you want, Baba, let me start first and then Faison. Just share a little bit about what is your real estate strategy, how long you've been in the industry, and anything else you'd love to share. Yeah, happy to. And uh, thanks again, Diana, for giving us this platform to come together to share our experiences as well as our uh, challenges as well, right? Um, so uh, from um, a strategy standpoint, uh, like both Faisan and myself, we are business partners. Our focus has been uh, primarily on uh, multifamily and land development projects. Uh, we do have an active business for uh, flipping single family houses in uh, the greater Toronto area. Um, but to your point, uh, you know, I think our uh, goal from a real estate investing strategy is to look at opportunities where we can not only add value from um, a number standpoint, but we're also looking to make an impact in the community. Um, so you know the project that we're going to be talking about is um, focused around the senior housing and uh, the the serious uh, crisis that's going on in Canada where there's a lack of supply and affordable care to serve our seniors uh, especially during the tail end of the years where it's critical for them to be around um, care services around the hospital so really we're looking to have a community impact uh, by executing this project, which I'm sure we're going to get into in a little bit. Awesome. Thanks. And would you like to add anything else to that, Faison? And you can just quickly share a little bit about yourself, too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I think like Babar mentioned, everything uh, he mentioned, basically what we're up to, we have an active strategy in the GTA. And then longer term, we're looking in uh, Alberta and in uh, New Brunswick at the moment. Um, for, you know, the multifamily strategy and uh, looking for development projects. Um, besides that, yeah, we've been uh, in uh, real estate as partners together for the last few years, since about 2021. And, um, yeah, I don't think there's much more to it. 
Awesome, awesome. Thanks for sharing. So let's get started on this deal. So let's talk about the project. So basically just a high level of like what the property looked like so that we can give people a visual. And what was your strategy? What was your intention behind it? Let's start with that. Whoever would like to start. Yeah, I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so uh, this uh, project uh, is in St. John. Uh, New Brunswick. Um, you know, when we found, or actually, let me talk about how we found this project because I think there's there's merit to sharing that. Um, you know, in real estate, uh, we stress a lot about relationships, about your network. So that is exactly how we came across this project. Um, we personally were not looking in New Brunswick, but we came across this opportunity to a really good relationship and you know organically there was a great fit there were great synergies you know our skill sets were complementing each other so Fezan and I we uh, decided to pursue this project in St. John New Brunswick which is smack downtown right across from the general hospital so when we found this project it um, was uh, an existing building and it was vacant so that obviously attracted us a lot because when you look at a vacant building, it's a blank canvas, right? You can accelerate your strategy. You could have uh, certain you know, financing conditions that would allow you to uh, execute your project much quicker because you don't have tenants to, um, uh, to, to work to. Um, the interesting fact was this, pro this building was owned by the Catholic Church. Now, as we all know, the Catholic Church is not in the business of real estate, right? They're, they're not equipped to manage an asset. They're not equipped to manage an asset to its highest and best use. And that is where we came in. That is where we understood the opportunity. We understood what really the vision was for the church. The church really wanted to play a role in uh, fulfilling senior housing um, near the hospital. Um, because there are medically discharged patients from the hospital that do not have housing in the vicinity and they are on long-term care. So, so that's a problem that we recognized and we saw an opportunity around it. Um, so that is exactly what we're doing is we are full gutting the inside of an existing building and creating 25 units of uh, senior assisted care. And so this is then a house and you're developing a building or or is it or can you give us a page just a picture of the building itself yeah it's an existing building it's an existing okay. uh 18,000 square feet three-story building uh so the structure is as is uh but the inside is going to be redeveloped into brand new uh 25 units and when i say seniors right like there's there's some specifics around that Right, the specifics are around accessibility. Right, there's specifics around uh, the building code. Uh, right, how the city looks at uh, senior housing, how the utility, the New Brunswick Power, looks at supplying backup power to that building. So there's a few aspects that come into play that make it a bit unique uh, compared to your typical multifamily. And so this building. You're, was it you were saying it was a church before or was it just owned by a church it was owned by a church oh, okay. and it was used in a variety of different fashions like it was once used as a red cross facility uh, once used as an overflow facility for beds during the covid pandemic so it was it was more of like an emergency time of need type thing ah uh, okay and now let's uh run through and what state is it at right now? Has it already been completed or is this like in the middle? Where are we right now in this project? So we just started renovations actually. We closed on it earlier this year and we just started renovations uh, earlier this year. So right now all demolition has been completed inside and we're just under uh, working underway with our suppliers to get materials on board while we're uh, doing the rough-ins for the actual units. Okay, awesome. So let's then, so then let's announce the numbers. I just wanted to make sure where we're at. So I'm like asking the right questions. <laughs> so let's run through the numbers. So what? Let's then we're gonna do a lot of projections. I think because what? So what? You, what did you guys purchase it at? We purchased at one point two five. And what were 
what are you expecting um, the value to be at the end once it's been fully renovated? I believe the value we were projecting is around 5.4 million. Mm -hmm. And and what are you expecting the renovations to be? Around three point three million dollars. Three point three million dollars. Okay, and uh, and that would be and then so high level. What kind of like what types of renovations? What does that encompass? Right. So essentially, that is going to cover a complete build out on the inside. Right. So we tore everything down on the inside. It's a blank slate. So the building is beautiful because it's a concrete building. Um, it makes it a little bit harder for rough ins, but from an actual construction perspective, it's it's uh, phenomenal because um, the building is in amazing condition. So uh, it, it includes the complete build out of 25 uh, complete units along with the different components required for accessibility. So, um, you know, the ramps, railings, all that. Um, they're all bachelor units. We're going to have, uh, not a commercial, but um, you could say a shared kitchen on each floor, um, and then laundry facilities on each floor. So it's essentially a complete build out on the inside of, of all three floors, uh, all rough-ins and everything, and uh, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And so with the three million, is that also including, uh, does that include your, um, like your regular monthly fees too? Or is that a separate cost on top? By monthly fee, you mean our holding costs? Your holding costs, yeah. That is on top. So um, the 3.3 million, that actually includes, so we, we actually had to go with uh, one of the largest, we went with one of the largest contractors in uh, St. John and you know it's, it's a, one of the oldest contractors around with a great reputation so they're taking care of certain things like utilities uh, and insurance but then uh, the holding costs that's basically the only thing that that we're taking care of so the holding costs are taken care of by us that includes our mortgage uh, our construction financing as well as uh, our debt to our partners oh, okay that's great and any other any other things? Oh, and what about, because for example, once the building is ready and finished, is this is, is this going to be a buy and hold or you're planning to sell it um, to a business that does senior homes? No, so this will be a buy and hold for us. So one of the biggest things that appealed to us with uh, this project, especially with regards to the numbers, was that the way the deal is structured we essentially own the real estate aspect of it, and that's all we are in charge of managing, right? So the tenants, toilets, uh, this and that, whatever, to do with the actual uh, building, that's what we're in charge of. Now, the, the senior care company, they will actually come in. It's a, it's a company that we're contracting out. So they will actually come in. Um, they're going to be placing in the tenants. They're going to be taking care of them for us they're essentially providing the services to the tenants, right? So what appealed to us really was when you compare it to a typical multifamily opportunity, you get you know, your, your cash flow from uh, your residential income and then you can have laundry, parking, um, and whatever else you can find to um, generate income. But what appealed to us was on top of all that, because of the senior care aspect, we get an income from the senior care company as well, because they're using our space to bring in these seniors and then provide services to them. And then obviously close, close proximity to the hospital allows us, uh, well, it's a great location, right? So it makes it a very practical location for any company to come in and have uh, the, the hospital right next to them for any extra care needed. And then the senior care kind of supplements the uh, care that the senior needs. That's amazing. That's great. And that's, uh, that's amazing because senior, like actually the services related to that, it's actually quite complicated and there's like lots of, lots of licensing involved. So I'm, so that company will take care of that. And so does that mean like, are they going to rent out the whole space and they pay you or is it still, for example, like they're finding the tenants, but then you receive, um, the pay on each unit separately, like as in separate leases. So, um, again, so the way we ended up dividing it was we get to handle the residential part, right? So we get income from the tenants. They will have separate leases with us. 
but then uh, the care component of it, they pay separately to the care company. Oh. So that's an additional uh, service on top that they pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we get both components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great approach. That's awesome. Any other uh, numbers, anything else that I missed out on there? Yeah, or you yeah. think a private, is it a private mortgage right now? You're going private. And it's private on the buy. Well, actually, let me clarify a little bit. I'm going to take a step back to just uh, talk about something that we may um, might be interesting for the viewers is um, the stakeholder management, right? To make this project exactly how Faisan described it, right? Um, it wasn't slam dunk like that from day one, right? We actually had to bring the people on the same table. And we had to make sure that everybody sees a win-win scenario. So who are those people, right? So that's the church, right? That's the hospital that is helping us get the tenants, the, the patients. Then it's the care uh, business that runs inside the hospital, right? So none of this would have been possible without the partnership that we were able to establish. And I'd also go as far as saying partnership with the city. Right, because the city also has a stake in seeing this uh, uh, building come to life. The city also has a stake in gentrifying the location, addressing a certain need. Um, so from that perspective, we had a lot of support uh, in terms of rebates and grants. Um, so we'll talk about that, but I just want to make a quick mention because it's, it's so critical to look at a project like this which is only possible when it comes with the right partners. 100%. And a great even point is the power of teaming up together, especially with these kind of projects. You can really get anything done if you, like you said, you're you know, partnering with the right people and um, everyone just understands, you know, what is their roles and how they can all, how the team can benefit each other to just make it happen. That's amazing. Yeah, and absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, you wanted to say something else? I, I wanted to address your question on uh, the financing. So if there was anything else, uh, we, could, we could talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think we covered all the numbers. Um, yeah, I think we covered all the numbers, at least for where we're at right now. I guess how much, actually, I guess right now in the phase you're in, um, since this is where in almost the beginning phases, how or even and planned i guess how is that how are you the money i'm assuming is getting is either getting raised in phases or it's getting also or is it getting like the money's there but it's being given in phases it's a good question uh i'll, I'll maybe speak at a high level and then Faison can talk about the actual structure um this uh particular deal qualified for CMHC MLI uh, select financing. So we were able to get our points through affordability and accessibility, all right? So those were the two points, uh, the two drivers. Um, we were extremely fortunate to get CMHC financing on the purchase. So what that meant was we were able to purchase the building plus CMHC gave us a construction loan, right? So th that construction amount that, that you're referring to is a function of draws that happens once we go through our milestones. So that is our, our overall structure of financing, but I, Faisal, you wanna add something in terms of uh, how we're managing um, the capital and how the draws are happening? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, exactly what Bavar said, right? We're getting uh, the loan in, uh, in, in draws. And the beautiful thing, because it's, uh, it includes a construction component. It's the, the construction program from CMHC. It actually is a loan to cost uh, mortgage, not a loan to value mortgage. So that includes our holding costs, our utilities, our building permits, our this, that, whatever, right? Um, so we get draws as the project goes on. And then with regards to the, the contractor, of course, we have a payment plan as well. So as they complete certain milestones, they get a certain payment. So that's essentially how, how the money is coming out at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's amazing. Um, and yeah, so it's, so is it two, 
like with CMHT, is that considered two separate loans? Like you have the MLI Select and then the development, or is that under MLI Select for the renovation costs? I mean, so it's it's um, their their new uh, financing program for new construction, actually. So essentially, it is a bridge loan, but I mean, even in, in regards uh, or with regards to the bridge aspect itself, the, the interest rate that we're getting is lower than typical bridge loans, right? Because it's DMHC insured. So it's one full loan that encompasses the purchase as well as the construction. And then at the back end, we have uh, essentially a loan approved for a certain amount for an ad complete value ready to go once we finish the project. Amazing. Amazing. And then so in that, how much did you guys, how much upfront money did you need to bring in to be able to facilitate all this and get it started? So, so there was uh, our down payment plus all the initial studies and then uh, CMHC also wanted us to have a certain amount of cash on hand and to uh, inject a certain amount of capital. So all in all, we ended up bringing about a million dollars, I believe, to uh, the project ourselves. And then everything else came from CMHC. That's amazing. And I, and I believe, or correct me if I'm wrong, that with that million dollars, um, that will probably include some of the like soft costs before getting right because i think in a development generally or in renovations of that size um they don't start funding you until like you're ready to say break ground is that right yeah absolutely so we had to go through the whole development process before we could start anything right so we were very fortunate mm -hmm. the development process kind of took place as we were coming to a close on the building itself uh, so a majority of that money was spent before closing even, and we had essentially permits in hand and uh, everything ready to go by the time we closed on the project. So, you know, the day we closed, I think the second day or the third day, we had demo started already. So we were for very fortunate in that way. And then on top of that, essentially the way the, the financing works, they want you to spend the money first. And then once you are at a certain point, um, you go and apply for a draw, mm -hmm. and then they come and take a look to make sure that yes, you are, um, you know, conducting your project as they wanted you to, as the initial plan was, and you are at the stage you say you're at, and then they they give you a draw. Mm -hmm. Amazing, that's really amazing. And so, how could so your holding period? Sorry, your due diligence period, or your until you're closing that period that you had. How long was it from? once you started once you made that first offer and you know all the like the things in between like you said because you were getting all the drawings and getting also the yeah the permits and everything taken care of so how long was that process there was quite a lengthy uh drawn out process because as we all know uh just from a negotiation standpoint um uh, things take time, uh, especially with the amount of partners and stakeholders that were involved in this project. It it, it took even longer. Um, but longer does not mean that there are challenges, right? Longer just means that it, it just takes time for people to come on board and and the city to go through their processes. So, you know, as Pezan said, we were fortunate to have access to the property during our due diligence period which basically allowed us to complete our architectural drawings. It allowed us to submit for city permits in advance of even closing on the property, right? Mm -hmm. so, so these were some strategic uh, ways that we positioned uh, the readiness of our file. Uh, so when we submitted it to CMHC with city permits approved, with a construction contractor and a detailed code and that to a construction contractor that is more of an entity that can sign on legal terms and conditions like schedule delays liquidated damages consequential damages you know these are all uh, factors that a mom and pop contractor cannot absorb right so we have to look at a large construction entity so we coupled all this in our file to cmhc it not only strengthened our file, but it also accelerated our approval. So we were actually mentally prepared that we're going to go to a bridge uh, lender private on the buy. We're going to get a construction loan, and then we're going to refinance to CMHC. 
But uh, lo and behold, we were so surprised that CMHC picked up our file in a month and a half from oh, the wow. time of submission. So we got an application number, and from then on, um, it was about another three weeks before we received our certificate of insurance directly from CMHC. So what does that mean? That basically means the tables have turned. We are no longer asking lenders, hey, will you lend us? The lenders are bidding on us that, hey, can we lend to you, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so that, that's an interesting change of dynamics, which allowed us to be more competitive in uh, getting the right, not just the terms, but also the conditions, because each of these loans come with lots of conditions, especially if you have shareholders on, um, on board, uh, if you have construction loans on board. So there's all these conditions that we have to meet. Uh, but yeah, we were fortunate that we uh, were able to close with a credit union in New Brunswick um, with that certificate of insurance. And so how long was that process from from first negotiate, or like the first offer in to the closing? Almost, I would say 10 months, if not longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. And that's something I just wanted to, uh, the reason I asked, because a lot of people think that they want to close quickly. And especially for buildings, it's so important, like you guys did, to just have all your ducks in a row. And as that's happening, like you said, new things are coming up where you're like, wow, this benefits me more than I expected. And um, and just like that, getting everything done, because it's also really great, because a lot of people, or not a lot, there's people that won't, for example, even have the permits in place, or for example, approvals from the city to just even say you can do things, which is so important because you imagine you close on something and then you can't do what you expected and you're having to pivot and change and maybe even lose the property because it just doesn't work to the what it's meant for because the city wouldn't accept the changes that you wanted. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that because I think that's great the approach that you guys took. I think it's amazing that you went this way and made sure that you even had up to the approval so you could basically on closing break ground because all those things really help the process completely because you also save in, for example, just interest payments of the building just sitting there while you're waiting for the city and everyone um, to like get the approvals done or the drawings done. So yeah, I think that's amazing. That's great that you guys did it that way and that you could even bring those teams together to get it. And oh, and I wanted to also reemphasize that the value of bringing in a contracting company that is meant for that type of work, like you said, not bringing in a mom and pop, like actually bringing someone in, because like you said, that comes with credibility. And because if they come with already experience in that area or big projects, things will just run a lot smoother. So sometimes spending the money on that just makes a lot more sense. So yeah, it's amazing what you guys have been able to achieve so far. That's awesome. Is this like your biggest project to date? I'd say yeah. so, yeah. So in terms of dollar and dollar value as well as the scope, uh, I think we didn't mention uh, the phase two. So, you know, so far we've been talking about the 25 units, right? But we also own the land right behind the building. Uh, so that's 3.2 acres, which we are going to sever into two lots. And we're currently working with uh, the developers and the architects and the city planners to uh, build 250 units on each of those lots. That's an additional 100 units. Um, again, more senior housing because we are so bullish on this niche sector. Uh, we're bullish on the location. You know, we have the right partners. We have the right infrastructure, the teams, the processes. So we are well positioned to grow in this space. Um, so to your point, right, like I think what you're emphasizing is, is, is really true, like in, in real estate, it's, it's not just about managing the numbers, it's also about managing risk. And uh, you do so with having the right partners and, uh, and structuring the deal, you know, in a way where you have a clear exit. Right now, we have a clear line of sight to what our exit looks like. It's not a, it's not a mystery to our partners on what potential returns and projections would look like. 100%, yeah, that's amazing. So as you've gone through this, the, all these different things so far, what do you say is the biggest problem that you've encountered so far? 
I think there were lots of um, you know issues that that we couldn't have foreseen from the start. Uh, I'll give you one of them, right? So it took us ten months, and uh, as much as everything was kind of uh, good to go uh, at the start of the project, one of the biggest things that happened to us was we had uh, financing lined up, like Babar said, with a bridge lender, and we had it lined up from a long time ago. And we're approaching closing, and last minute the lender turns around and says, "Hey, you know what?" For no particular reason, we're no longer comfortable lending on this project anymore. And see you, bye bye. Right. So that happened to us very close to closing, and it was just very fortunate that the building itself is vacant. Um, the church was kind of so far in with us that we were able to turn around and renegotiate with them and and ask for an extension. And it ended up being a better situation for us because then obviously we discovered the CMHC product. Uh, so that turned out to be a better scenario for us. And then there were certain other smaller things that kind of came back to um, hurt us or push us back just a little bit. For example, uh, the city had given us the go ahead for basically everything. And then they turned around towards the end and said, hey guys, by the way, um, I think this might have even been once we closed on the project, but they turned around and said, hey, by the way, you need to reapply for a rezoning. And this is after they've given us the building permit and all. And we're like, okay, that should have been step one, uh, a rezoning <laughs> to residential should have been step one. But they asked for this after the go ahead. We basically started demo and everything, and they came back to us with this. But even because we had been talking to the city for so long, and we had, we had a lot of... Um, big players in the city involved, right? So we had been talking to uh, a lot of the councillors in the area. We had spoken to the mayor. We had talking to a lot of uh, bigger players that were helping us get this project through. So because of that, the, the process for rezoning did not take us long at all. I think all in all from submission until uh, approval, it took maybe a few weeks. Um, so we got through that process very quickly. Um, and then besides that, there were small uh, hiccups here and there. I think, um, for example, a lender being a small, a smaller lender in New Brunswick, um, they had a lot of different requests, a lot of, um, yeah, essentially their, their due diligence was probably almost as long and tedious as ours on, on us as partners, on all uh, the shareholders on uh, our plans and the project. And uh, so that in itself was also, it took a bit of a push to get that part uh, completed. But there were lots of uh, essentially, yeah, there were, there were lots of small things or even bigger things that came up during the project that uh, pushed us back and made us need to pivot to you know, another strategy to look at things again, uh, to do this and that, so uh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a, those are there's always things, and I think the bigger the project, the more pivoting you have to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Is there any other any other problems that you wanted to discuss? Maybe I'll I'll sprinkle uh, a different flavor because I think Faizan did a great job in covering those uh, challenges. Um, in any real estate project, um, I think it's really important how well you communicate, um, how well you influence, how well you negotiate. Uh, those are very important skills. They're, these are soft skills that are often overlooked. And when not executed properly, they will uh, result in problems. So a lot of times you can navigate um, issues by communicating effectively, by you know making sure that what you are looking for is clearly understood, the quality of your questions elicit the responses that uncover pain points, so you can figure out a win-win. Because you know this could be a this could slow down a process, and when people are not on board, and that could also mean your partners, right? So how you how well you communicate, not just with external stakeholders, but also internal stakeholders is equally important because in projects, time is of the essence and you just can't drag things or delay decisions just because of your inability to come to a consensus. 
percent and that's a uh, great that you brought that up because actually that was anyway is going to be my next question <laughs> because uh relationship building especially like that once it has it's at a bigger scale you are for example negotiating and kind of mitigating different people to make sure the projects like you said move forward so i was actually going to ask you how was even um for example like you said the negotiation you negotiate with the the church but then also the negotiations and all these people just coming together how what were the kind of you know like you said pain points that came up that you had to pivot between just getting people to work together on uh and and accept this kind of project or want to be a part of this project yeah, that's a, that's that's a loaded question, uh, but like I think, you know, <laughs> the big I'll, one, I'll, the big one. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think I'll give a perspective, and and you know, Faisal will also share his perspective. But you know, we've been really fortunate that uh, we've had great partners that are boots on the ground, um, you know, that had the relationship with the the church. Um, so, you know, that was established from the beginning and then we were able to harvest and grow that relationship. Um, I think the, the biggest uh, learning is that when we're uh, managing relationships, right, it comes down to managing expectations, right? So you have an option to say yes to everything and promise the world and you know how that's going to turn out or you could could um, be a bit more, um, I would say, uh, conservative in your expectations, but also uh, trying to make the other party understand where you're coming from. And, you know, people will always appreciate um, some progress, even if it's not in the same amount of magnitude, but that develops trust, right? If you do what you say and you say what you do, those little things will snowball and without trust this deal would have been fallen apart like maybe a long time ago right mm -hmm. so we went through a roller coaster ride and we took the church with us mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so we appreciate the faith and the trust that they had in us because at any given time they could have said you guys are just creating excuses and you're not going to close mm -hmm. Right. So making sure that they have the confidence in us uh, because they're getting to know us as partners um, and also being transparent. Right. So when we are working with the city, when we are working with the contractors, when we're onboarding investors, we did keep the church up to date that, hey, this is our progress to date on this file. And this is the this is the progress we've made. So that really uh, relaxed the church a little bit because I find sometimes People say that, hey, when the result is there, I'll go deliver the outcome. But sometimes you want to get people involved much earlier on just so they know that, okay, you're moving in the right direction. I love, love that. That is really great that you say that because I also believe the same thing. Like you said, you know, basically you're saying that even though the church really didn't need to know this information, like all they would really care about is closing on it. But like you said, if you didn't keep them up to date with what, with what was going on, you could have lost that deal because you said you're going to close on this date and it didn't happen. And now you're making an excuse that funding didn't happen when you said it was already approved. And so it's just like you can see how keeping the church up to date on everything that was happening um, just gives them also gives them a view of your side of all the work that you're doing and that you are truly making step forward. Even like you said, even though, you know, it took maybe longer than 10 months to close, but as long as they're seeing the movements happening, um, really that's all I feel people care about is as long as you're seeing the progress or even in communication in other areas, right? If, if all the stakeholders just understand what's going on, you really mitigate the problems of miscommunication or the or their lack of information which can cause people to again that even lack of information will they will get confused they don't know what's happening in it and then they start losing confidence in you because they don't know because you're not sharing and when you don't share they think like oh are they really even doing anything for example is anything even moving forward 
So yeah, I think that's great that you that you brought that up because communication, even from the small projects, but I think these big projects is where you really see the impact of communication because there are so many other players involved in it. So that's amazing that you that you speak of that because yeah, I completely. Uh, agree with you and I think that's a great point like I said especially with these types of big projects it's so important to have that be transparent because I mean what's the point of hiding the information anyways I think right like you're basically just saying hey we're working and this is what's going on why wouldn't they want to know this right like who what's the point of hiding that information really yeah absolutely I think one of the things that I'll add in there was that um we were very fortunate, especially when it comes to a larger project of this size, right? It's one thing to do smaller projects with, let's say, just Babar and I. But when it came to a larger project of this size, we were very fortunate to have uh, two other partners as well that kind of helped us manage everything. Uh, and, and that allowed us to, to work more efficiently within our own roles and with our partners. And, um, you know, as long as everyone, because it was a larger team, everyone was able to kind of stick to their role and it helped push everything more efficiently and push or keep everything in line. I think that's one of the biggest things for this project that we discovered as well, that it was more of a, a we getting things done together rather than Babar and I trying to undertake this massive thing on our own, right? And mm -hmm. um, just like in any business, in any larger business, you have an individual for each specific role. Um, that's kind of how we ended up managing this project and uh, it worked out very well for us. So I think that's one of the biggest things that sometimes you need to look at, especially with these larger projects, you need to look at what role you're best at and what role you're not best at and, and delegate what you don't want to take care of or cannot take care of as efficiently as someone else. And essentially make sure you do have the right teams in place so that you can carry out your own roles to the best of your effort, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. That is a that's a great point. And now that you said that, with because you guys have been working together for a while, but for those other people, did you already know them? Um, did you know how they work, or was that something that you guys had to kind of sit down and figure out who was doing what, or did you kind of already know how people were going to be working? I think um, to a certain extent, our roles, so our roles were defined in the start, but as things went on, as always, roles get uh, shifted here and there. Um, so that's kind of what happened here as well. We have Boots on the Ground partner in New Brunswick, uh, and then we have another partner who's helping kind of bridge uh, uh, all the different sections of, of the project, right? So as the project goes on even now, the roles are still kind of moving moving fluidly where, for example, we started on one side of the project and now we're helping manage the construction or bring uh, suppliers to the table because we have experience or expertise in that, right? So we're bringing our own suppliers or our own construction expertise into the project. So um, we're very fortunate that our partners as well, uh, along with us, uh, we all respect each and every person's expertise and we're willing to uh, communicate and listen to each other's opinions and because of that we've turned around and been you know many times said hey you know what uh, we may not be the pr best person to deal with this problem or deal with this situation and maybe somebody else um, is better in line to deal with it so with regards to that, yeah, the partnership itself was pretty new. One of the investors we knew from before, but we had never worked with before. Uh, and the the part or the the relationship just kind of developed as the project went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And I just feel like even another thing that I feel like you're alluding to is just that um, being problem solving and not tying yourself down to specific roles too because when you're in those types of situations like you said especially i think this is very very normal as you're getting to know yourself as a team those roles are going to be very fluid because you're getting to know each other and you're getting to know this project too so it's like multiple things being learned out at the same time there's not only okay figuring out how how this project is going to work because it's so big 
but at the same time you're figuring out each other and being able to kind of fluidly allow like okay you know i'm doing this but then all of a sudden you're like oh wait but you're better suited for this or as you guys get to know each other so probably by the end of this project you guys will really all know each other very very well <laughs> know exactly what you're good at you'll probably have your world finally defined it at the end of the project for your next new project you know <laughs> I think so too. And I think in the beginning of a project, you can almost never foresee the issues you're going to have, right? Um, for example, the financing issue we mentioned when uh, we were um, getting to uh, the closing in the beginning, we were like, hey, we have financing ready to go. There's, it's not a problem you can foresee. Everything's approved. Everything is you know ready to go. Um, and then last minute, they, they pulled back. So with something like that, then obviously we have to get together, figure things out again. And even now, as we go, small issues come up here and there that you just cannot foresee. Yeah. And it's it's the strength of the team that defines how well you deal with the problem rather than the expertise of each uh, individual. Mm -hmm. And even how different the team members are, because like you said, you come together, you mastermind, we have a problem and, you know, what someone may bring a solution that the others never thought of and and for example you would have never even thought they may know that could not maybe that's not their area of expertise it's someone else's but sometimes even that outside perspective you're just like well why don't we try this and then it's like why didn't you think of that before you know <laughs> so it's definitely like the masterminding it's amazing and especially like that 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 you guys have brought together a team where you're all problem solvers and just let's pivot, let's move, let's figure it out, because that is, I think, the testament to a good team being able to successfully finish and go through a project is that ability to be able to adapt and just be like, we have a problem, let's solve it and not crumble under it. And I think one thing I'll add to uh, what Fezan mentioned about uh, the teamwork, right? Um, so we've, we've lived this through our partnership, we have lived this through other partnerships as well, is that uh, the the skill sets really have to be complementary, right? Our, our our goal is not to get along as uh, friends who just agree with everything we say. It's actually the opposite, right? Um, you know, having different personality sets uh, is not a bad thing. Um, in fact, it is in the differences where the opportunity lies, right? Because you know, they say, right, like every every optimist needs a Debbie Downer, right? It's, it's one of those things where you have to, everybody has blind spots and everybody needs a different perspective. Um, so if you are open and you have our trust in the team, then a lot of times one partner may say something that is completely opposite, but it's the debate and it's how we come to that equilibrium that is where the true, I would say, benefit of the partnership lies. It's, it's in the differences. 100%. Love that. Yeah, it's very true. You need all those different personalities. Sometimes they may clash. Probably will clash a few times throughout the project. But in the end, you know it's worth it because sometimes you need those clashes also to just learn even how to navigate each other or learn you know where everyone is best suited any final comments that you guys wanted to share about the project or anything else about you guys i think uh not a whole lot about the project itself we're excited for uh like babar mentioned we have uh the development that's going to be coming after so this is kind of the phase one of our project it's kind of a trial run uh, and for us as well, it's our first, um, you know, out of province project where we're managing from afar. So in that way, it's kind of the pilot project to the bigger project. So that's the the, the bigger project that we're really looking forward to, where we'll be developing, you know, two fifty unit buildings side by side, uh, right next to the hospital as well. Same exact structure and everything. That is uh, is essentially uh, the the next step for us, and we're working towards. Uh, through completing this project. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be a fun project for you guys to be working on. And uh, and definitely you guys are going to be learning a lot from it. That's amazing. And hopefully, maybe in a year from now, we'll do another status update to see how this project's going on, how the new development's going on. It'll definitely be fun to hear progress for sure. 
Any yeah. last comment, Babar? Do you want a last comment that you wanted to add um, on that? I, I, I think, yeah, I'll just echo what Faizan said is, um, you know, one thing leads to another. Um, that the message here is is that you know we wouldn't be doing phase two if phase one didn't happen. Um, you know we wouldn't be growing in New Brunswick if we hadn't you know looked at the first opportunity. Um, so it's it's about getting started and it's about uh, then developing your ecosystem, your power team, you know your capabilities to scale around that area because you know for us. We, we don't want to be too stretched out in too many different areas, too many different markets. We do uh, like the ability to double down focus because at the end of the day, that could be your unfair advantage. Uh, we know there's a lot of competition, um, but the type of assets that we're focused on is really uh, pivoted on good locations and uh, a strategy which you know fits with our overall vision of senior housing uh, specific to uh, New Brunswick. I love it, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. It was so much fun to hear about your project. If you guys love what you heard from Bawa and Faison, they will be tagged on here so you can check what they're up to, check on their projects, DM them if you're interested in talking to them. And if you guys love my shows or you want to see what I'm up to these days, then definitely follow me too. Thank you guys for coming on. It was so much fun to have you on. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much Diana. Diana. Thank you. Uh, Awesome. We'll see everyone on the next episode. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.